34. Because every Gethsemane is his garden, and every Calvary is his cross. We are grateful to God this day for being with Terry as he shared her agony. We're grateful to God today for the Castagno family as they cared for Terry as she prepared to enter eternal life. The love, concern, the presence of the Castagno family were examples of the passionate love and abiding concern that is the divine life among us. Our lives are far richer today because of your example of authentic family values. Surely there's much to mourn as there was on Calvary, for you shall have to wait for the resurrection on the last day before you feel the gentle pressure of her touch and before you see the smile light up Terry's eyes once again. And that is sad, no matter how profound our faith. And yet the Christian truth remains. Terry is alive, alive with the life of Jesus Christ, because even in death, the Holy Spirit never left her. More alive than she ever was before, because every tear is past, every disease, every weakness of our fragile humanity, we are grateful this day because in the presence of God, there is only God, there is only love. Great 
The first reading is from Proverbs 31, verses 10 through 31. An excellent wife who can find. She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She is like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable, her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the distaff and her hand holds the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. She makes bed coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchant. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. The word of the Lord. You 
shall cross the barren desert, but you shall not die of thirst. You shall wander far in safety, though you do not know the way. You shall speak your words in foreign lands, and all will understand. You shall face of God and live. Be not afraid. I go before you always. Come, follow me. And I waters in the sea you shall not drown if you walk amid the burning flames you shall not be harmed if you stand before the power of hell and death at your side. Know that I am with you through it all. Be not afraid. I go before you This is a reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Thessalonians. We do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, about those who have fallen asleep, so that you may not grieve like the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose, so too will God, through Jesus, bring with him all those who have fallen asleep. Indeed, we tell you this on the word of the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will surely not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself, with a word of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, will come down from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus, we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, console one another with these words. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. reading from the Gospel of John. Jesus said to his disciples, 
Do not let your hearts be troubled. You have faith in God. Have faith also in me. In my father's house, there are many dwelling places. If there were not, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back again and take you to myself, so that where I am, you also may be. Where I am going, you know the way. Thomas said to him, Master, we don't know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. This afternoon, I would like to lift out of context one verse from the 35th Psalm. The writer wanted to express an experience of intense grief. And he said it like this. I bowed down in sorrow as one who mourns his mother. To feel the force of those words, it's not necessary for us to suppose that the death of one's mother is the greatest of all earthly sorrows. Quite often, that's not the case. There can be no deep and bitter and abiding grief in the death of someone who has lived long and well. And Terry has done both of those. She was 83 years old, and the quality of her life was such that she earned the love and respect not only of her family, but of her faith community and of the larger community as well. She was the kind of person who will be missed by many, many people. But it would not be appropriate for us to bitterly grieve her passing. And yet there is something unique about the death of one's mother. It touches chords deep on the inside that are not touched by any other experience. And this is true because the relationship between mother and child is unique. The two of you began to get acquainted before you were ever born. Probably the first sound you ever heard was the beating of her heart. She shared life with you in a way that no other person ever has or ever will. The bond that exists between you is one that is found nowhere else. A person may have many, many friends, but only one mother. She met you as you entered this world, and her first emotion toward you was love. You had nothing to give your mother but utter helplessness, which she accepted and committed herself to your needs. And for a long while, that was the nature of your relationship. She was the giver, and you were the taker. She cared for you during those growing years when you couldn't possibly care for yourself. One of our poets expressed this in a brief and beautiful verse. He said of his mother, unnumbered comforts on my soul, her tender care bestowed. Before my infant mind conceived, from whom those comforts flowed. The relationship between mother and child is unique. And her death is the passing of an era. Another effect of the death of a mother is how it changes our concept of home. For most of us, when we were young, home was not so much a place as it was a person. Wherever mother lived, that was home. We were accepted there. We belonged there. 
And with the passing of time, most of us moved away. And some other place became our primary home. Nevertheless, there was a sense in which home and mother continue to be one and the same. We confidently expect that whoever might be against us, she will be for us. That kind of caring makes any spot on earth seem somewhat like home. And so when a mother dies, it leaves a bit of a void in the place where home used to be. In closing, I'd like to focus my attention on just one other verse of Scripture. It's found in the book of the prophet Isaiah, and it says this. Can a mother forget her infant, be without tenderness for the child of her womb? Even should she forget, I will never forget you. When the prophet put those words in the mouth of God, he wasn't disparaging his mother or any mother. He was simply reminding us that there is a love that surpasses all human loves, even the love of a mother. It's the tender, kind, compassionate love of God. And that love will always be ours. We cannot outgrow it, outlive it, or move off and leave it behind. Most of the time the scriptures speak of God as a father. Jesus taught his disciples to think of him that way. But I do find it interesting on several occasions the biblical writers compared the love of God to the love of a mother. I'd like to speculate for a moment on the reason for that comparison. I think it might be this. There are times in our lives when we need to be loved with gentleness, with understanding, with unquestioning sympathy, the way a mother loves her child. However long we live, we never completely outgrow the need for that kind of love. And one of the times we need it most is when we've just lost the one who loved us that way. So we're invited this afternoon to rest our souls in the love of God, which is always strong, like the love of a father, but is also gentle, like the love of a mother. May God be praised. My brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ is risen from the dead and is seated at the right hand of the Father, where he intercedes for his people. Confident that God hears the voices of those who trust in the Lord Jesus, we now join our prayers to his. response will be, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are leading our country in these difficult times, that we may recover economically and spiritually, and continue to help and serve our neighbors without judgment. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Many people die by violence, war, famine, and global pandemic each day. Show your mercy to those who suffer so unjustly, and bring them to the kingdom of eternal peace. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. In baptism, Mary Teresa received the light of Christ. Scatter the darkness now and guide mom to, he, to her, her eternal home with you. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. 
Many friends and members of our families have gone before us and await the kingdom, especially deceased members of the Castagno and Vance families. Grant them an everlasting home with your son. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray that cures may be found for such horrible illnesses, such as Parkinson's and cancer, and that the ill may find strength and have faith and to believe in you and your plans for them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Having lost a keystone of a family unit, we pray that your guidance, our family can persevere the ties that have bound us to this day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, giver of peace and healer of souls, hear the prayers of the Redeemer, Jesus Christ, and the voices of your people, whose lives were purchased by the blood of the Lamb. Forgive the sins of all who sleep in Christ, and grant them a place in your kingdom. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. My name is Chris Castagno. On behalf of my brothers, Stephen, Vincent, Patrick, and my sister Teresa at the end over there, we want to welcome you to the celebration of our mother, Terry Castagno. I want to say a special thanks to Aunt Pat and our cousins, the Salter family, for being here with us and your constant support throughout the years. And Terry loves you. I also see members from Holy Family Parish Community, the famous nurses and their families, work colleagues and friends, and so many friends of our family. Thanks for being here, and thanks to all of you who are live streaming online for being here with, for us in our celebration of Mom's life. You know, it seems like we were just in a, a space like this only 18 months ago with the passing of Terry's husband, Al Castagno, our father. And it, it's, it's a tough loss, not only to lose a mother, but to lose a mother and a father in the span of 18 months. And I gotta tell you, I got a range of emotions that I'm overcome by. Uh, a deep sadness, a, a certain calmness, relief in a way, joy for mom in the passing. She had a pretty rough last decade or so of health issues, and a certain loneliness about losing a mother and a father in 18 months. But let me tell you something about our mom. Mom seemed to know what needed to happen and when. She was the organizer, the drill sergeant, the consoler. A large family required organization, logistics, and a strategy. Mom was that nerve center of our family. She was very demanding, often very critical. But she was always there to be the positive healer. She made the trains run on time, as they say. She expected much from her children. She believed that to those who were given much, much was expected. We were given much. We were given mom's relentless commitment to each of us, and she defined our place within our family. This created a connectedness of our family, and we witnessed a living example of the meaning of service to others. I remember the family conference at our kitchen table every Sunday while we were growing up. This was a meeting where the weekly chores were assigned and ultimately posted on the refrigerator in case we forgot. These jobs included washing and drying the dishes, sweeping the floor, taking out the trash, and sometimes some laundry. The Saturday list included dog poop cleanup, washing the car, cutting the grass, weeding, and other lists of things. And it didn't seem unusual to us as we were growing up. It was just the way it was. I wasn't crazy about any of those chores at all, 
But what discipline and responsibility this taught me and, my, and our family, great life lessons. Mom made sure that each of us got one round of meal for dinner. There usually wasn't enough for seconds, but she made sure we at least got one in the early days. Mom was the first to come to our bed in the early morning and sing happy birthday to you on our special day. Actually, that ritual carried on for decades, even up till this year even, singing to us that same rendition on the phone to all of us, no matter where we lived in the world. Mom worked the 3 to 11 shift at St. Francis in the early days, balanced the hours with Dad's work from 6 to 3. Mom worked many holidays except Christmas, I think for the extra pay back in those days. We never missed her baking the special hot milk cake with fluffy icing. I think that was Nana's recipe for our birthday, though. Each Sunday, Mom marshaled the mobilization of a seven-member family to attend Mass at Holy Angels, then Holy Family, where she was a founding member. Missing Mass was not an option for any reason, and being late was never, never acceptable. We took up the entire pew, actually, when we went to Mass. She used to say, never forget your God. Time constraints didn't seem to stop her from being the den mother at Cub Scouts, the active mother at Holy Angel School, where we went to grade school, the loyal cheerleader at our activities, games, or track meets. Mom was the camp nurse at Camp Rasan, the summer camp run by the Oblates of St. Francis de Sales. We were able to attend that only because she gave up her vacation time at St. Francis to work there as a nurse. These were formative years for us during our youth. We wouldn't have had an opportunity to go to camp without the gift of time that mom, get, mom gave. I believe that mom's family was her purpose. But as time went on, I came to know that she was a vibrant source of energy in every situation, even the life of the party sometimes, a friend to those who needed help, a friend to strangers and animals, we always had a rescue dog in the house, and a compassionate healthcare professional. Mom's work life evolved from floor nurse to nursing instructor, where she was the life force to her patients, her colleagues, and students. I am sure many of you are here that, that can attest to that. Mom enjoyed being a nana to her grandchildren, Annie, Joni, Claire, Joseph, Luca, and a great nana to Avery, Kanan, and Omar. She had an adventurous spirit that we saw as we grew older. As her daily mom duties lessened over time, I remember that she flew to Germany to meet Stevie for a part of his tour through Europe. He, he treated himself to a college graduation trip. She did the same the following year with Vincent after his college graduation. She traveled to Estes Park, Colorado to visit Patrick where he was working for the summer and frequently traveled to St. Croix to visit John and Teresa for Teresa's birthday. Mom was the first on the plane to Hong Kong to visit Karen and me when our daughters were born. In fact, she made a couple trips, one with her brother Michael where they were fearless in trying street food, <laughs> traveling, right? traveling to villages in China and going on boat trips through the Hong Kong Harbor. She even helped with potty training while she was there. She was a mother at her core. Later in her retirement, Mom, with Dad, Aunt Pat, Aunt Marnie, Uncle Mike, were frequent travelers on the storied Father Fury European trips. She had a real zeal, zeal for life and wanted to experience it all. We learned only a few days ago that she wanted to take an African safari. So sorry, Mom. We're going to take that in your name. So we miss you, Mom. A life well lived. May your energy and passion for life and service to other, others live on in all of us. We love you.
you know, this has been happening a long time, following my brother. <laughs> wearing these clothes that he got from him and <laughs> taking all my good ideas for today. <clears throat> Great job. <clears throat> my name's Patrick. I'm the fourth child of Terry and Alfonso. I know for me to have this opportunity to stand up here and to tell you a little bit about my mother is one of the great honors of my life. On behalf of my sister and brothers, oh, by the way, I'm sorry, there will be some overlap. We decided not to talk to each other about this uh, because, you know, we wanted to do our own thing, and that's fine. So sorry for the overlap, but there will be some. And on behalf of my sister and my brothers, we want you to know how thankful we are that you are here today in this uncertain time in all of our lives to celebrate the magnificent life of our mother. We want you to know that we feel your love and support today. Thank you. Many of you are here today because you knew our mother as family, as classmate, co-worker from church, from the neighborhood, or you're a friend of one of ours. Finally, one person today uh, knew her all 84 years, her sister, Aunt Pat. Some of you may be here today, known my mother less than a year, the kind folks at the assisted living facility Rockland Place, where she lived until March. Our mother was a caregiver her whole life, and it was only in the last few years that she was on the receiving end of being cared for. And let me tell you, this was not a place she liked at all. Ask any of her caregivers at the Rockland Place who tried to tell her what to do. She was happy and respectful, but still in charge, even from that wheelchair. I guess once a nurse, always a nurse. She would let you know when she thought you were doing something right or doing something wrong. And she was never afraid of falling to the ground if it meant just being able to get up from that wheelchair when she wanted to on her own. Mom was an extremely independent woman her entire life. I guess you never know when God feels you have done enough on this earth and it is time to leave and be called home. None of us ever thought it would be June 13th. In the last few months, she was doing so well. She would have been 84 years old a couple of days ago, June 19th, and yes, even though she had every ailment in the book, including stage four cancer, dementia, Parkinson's disease, we still wanted her to stay. Now that I think about it, I guess that's a little selfish. She never complained of pain and she never wanted to leave. She loved her family and her friends so much. She never even talked about death. All she wanted to know was, what are we doing tomorrow? She even denied she was in declining health. What's all the fuss for? I'm fine. But mom, you have stage four cancer. That's what they told me last time and I got over it. <laughs> she had a strong will and I just couldn't disagree with, with her logic. The past few years have been tough watching her go through some difficult situations with her health, which required all of us at different times to pitch in with her care. On several occasions, she asked me to help her get to the toilet, not knowing I was making some kind of face when taking her clothes down. <laughs> she looked at me and said, oh, stop being such a big baby. <laughs> I changed your diapers four times a day for years. We both started laughing. She made it a little bit more comfortable. But you know what, in fact, she's right. I calculated that with five kids, she changed almost 30,000 diapers. And aside from my brother Vincent, who pushed that number extra high, <laughs> that really made me think about how we all just need to step it up for her. When we were growing up, she was definitely the head of operations in our house. She ran a pretty tight ship. 
even to, enough to get five kids out the door on time every day with one bathroom and then get herself to work. On Saturdays, most of our friends could sleep in, but not us. She would come into the bedroom, wake us up, opening the curtains and say, rise and shine, and direct us to the chore list posted on the refrigerator. When asked about an allowance, allowance she said, get a job. <laughs> I guess that's why we all have paper routes. Our mother was not a friend to us growing up. She was our mom, and she set the rules. She instilled in us a set of remarkable values and rules to live by and reminded us often, don't sweat the small stuff, or the smallest good deed is better than the grandest intention. And she signed every letter with, never lose touch with your goals or your God. She ran our house on a shoestring budget, but we had all we needed. Whenever one of us would stop by unannounced with some friends, magically within 15 minutes, there would be a feast on the table out of thin air, all put together with coupons. <laughs> she taught us hard lessons and was not afraid to show and tell us how unhappy she was with a poor decision. I think we all remember being held down while having your mouth washed out with soap because of a cuss word. She meant business. I still, thought, I still think I have brain damage from that soap. <laughs> as tough as she was, everything was done in love. She had this special way of making us feel like we were the only one in the room. And that you were most important to her. That is an extraordinary parenting skill. For her, for her adult life with her family, her day revolved around making sure everyone else had what they needed first. She never had time in her life to worry about herself or worry about doing things that would put her ahead of someone else. Her life focus was on others, and her chosen line of work speaks to that. My mother was a nurse for 35 years at St. Francis Hospital, and we rarely, rarely heard much of her day. Our usual 6 p.m. dinner time with all seven of us in strategically assigned seats around the table began with a prayer. Then we started eating. She asked each kid to tell the best part of their day. My parents didn't usually play. They just listened. But on one occasion, when I was about 12 years old, my mom said she had an interesting day at the hospital. Everybody continued to eat. She proceeded to tell us that one of her patients coded, stopped breathing, and was rushed, and she rushed to the room when she heard the alarm. She gave the patient CPR for several, min for several minutes, and the patient threw up all over my mother, but began breathing again and was ultimately fine. Of course, we all stopped eating and looked at her. <laughs> the next thing she said, can somebody please pass the salt? I'll never forget that moment as it helped me develop an incredible respect for my mom, who she was, what she did for others, and how she lived her, her life without expecting much in return. She was a humble person. We were lucky to have a mother with such strong values rooted in Catholic faith and who expects of us that good deeds are part of your every day on this earth. She practiced what she preached. Her commitment to her faith in God was clear to all of us. She was a tireless volunteer as you've heard from my brother at Holy Family. She was a Eucharistic minister, a lector, an out, uh, outreach program volunteer, a parish nurse, a church carnival committee member, and much more. Today, I think it's really important that we recognize a few people for their constant love and support of our mother. First, from the Rockland Place, Sarah, Maria, Dana, and Cindy. There were many who interacted with our mother, but you guys were in another league. You met my mother on June of 2019, and you were with her every day. We appreciate the respect you showed her during times when she couldn't put the right words together or she was frustrated and tired. You put us all at ease knowing she went to bed each night safe and sound and comfortable. You even laid down in bed with her sometimes just talking until she fell asleep. There really are no words to do justice to how much we all love you for this. You are truly a credit to your professions because your passion for caring comes from your heart and not your paycheck. 
to Aunt Pat. You may never fully understand how much it meant to your sister and to all of us that you spent so much time with her in the past three months. That special time you and mom spent was not coincidental. If there was anyone in this world my mom felt really comfortable at home with, it was you. You were there the day she was born and you were with her on the day she died. Thank you for watching over her. To my sister, when we brought mom home in March after discovering that she had a few months left, you didn't hesitate. You booked the next flight, you left John, your husband, your dog, your Airbnb business, and your paradise of a home in St. Croix for three months to take on the lion's share of the caring for mom. You spent 24 hours a day, seven days a week, making sure she was happy and entertained, on a schedule, clean, and engaged, even if that meant you barely slept at night. You are amazing. And more importantly, you're, you're an incredible daughter. Mom loved you for being there for her when she needed it most. Okay, and here we go. Ready for this? To my mom. I know you can hear me. I know it's been tough for you, going from superwoman to wheelchair bound and forgetful. You never stopped being the glue that held our family together, our strength. Even though your best was gone, you were still in charge. You got tired, your eyes grew dim, and God knew it was time. You fought the good fight, Mom and you kept your faith in God. To be honest, there's a part of me that knows we had you longer than we probably should have. For this, I'm grateful. Thank you for the life you gave me and for being our mother, our teacher, and always having the answer. Thank you for the sacrifices you and dad made to give us a stable home life and a strong foundation for the rest of our lives. I am who I am because of you, it's that simple. The last thing you said to me before you passed away was, please don't leave me. Well, I'm asking the same of you. Please watch over us and tell Fuzzo how much we miss him. <laughs> Man, we were lucky to have you as a mother. Rest in peace.
I have known Terry and Al for almost 50 years. I first met them, I think I was minus nine. <laughs> and when I think about our long relationship, clearly Camp Brisson was central. In fact, forever fixed in my mind is the idyllic image of looking down Camp's long road toward the flagpole. And over the horizon step Patrick and Teresa holding hands. Unusual for a two and four year old, but they did. It seemed like very much out of the playbook of the Cleaver family. And that's probably dating myself as well. And right behind the happy two was the treasured Terry. It was then that we knew our day could begin. Terry was here, and all was right with our world. Terry then would engage Patrick and Teresa and set about her very demanding day. After breakfast, the line of campers would extend to the parking lot, and hovering nearby was a significant number of adults who were the camp staff. They all had ailments that only Terry could or would address. Some in that line needed some medication. Some had minor injuries that needed tending. More were homesick. And some just needed someone to listen and to care. Whatever Terry's diagnosis, the treatment was always the same. Terry instinctively knew what everyone's real need truly was, despite what they said. A compassionate listener, gentle advice, words of encouragement, a genuine and friendly smile, and a warm hug. Terry's treatment would get them all through the day, or at least till lunch, when they would line up again, <laughs> and later at dinner. And one thing, whenever I encountered Terry, for whatever reason, she was always mellow, never 
never alarmed. I guess raising five children can do that to a person. See, for many years, Terry was the pillar of our camp program. And she served there at a significant sacrifice to her own family. I think of her beloved Al, her husband of almost 60 years, working literally seven days a week to provide for his family and for private education, and sharing his wife with so many other people. Thank you, Al, for your understanding. The vacation mentioned earlier that her family couldn't take because of all the vacation time that she used in order to be present with us. Terry's person, gift, and presence were eternally appreciated by the Oblates of St. Francis de Sales. From her considerable sacrifice came magnificent relationships that lasted all life long. And for that, we are most grateful. Reading Terry's obituary, seeing her engagements with the larger community, it was overpowering to me. I knew that, and yet Terry would have been more engaged if there were more hours in the day and more days in the week and more weeks in the year and more years in a rich and profoundly fruitful life. And for that, we are grateful. Terry touched us all with her positive attitude with her tireless commitment to make part of our world a better place, especially the part of the world she touched most closely. She wanted everyone to live, to hope, and to dream, and to laugh, and to love. I always found that quality about Terry highly contagious, and we benefited greatly from that. We're keenly aware of Terry's passion for life, her love of family and her friends, and her devotion to her Christian faith and its values. Blessedly, she shared that with her children, and she shared that with all the people she touched in this life. From her richness, we have all received. And Chris, Steve, Vinny, Patrick, Teresa, you are extraordinarily blessed with such example, such presence, such love. Thank you for sharing her with so many of us. And thank you, Lord, for such a gifted treasure as Terry Castagno. Father of mercies, we commend our sister Terry 
in the sure and certain hope that together with all who have died in Christ, you will rise with him on the last day. We give you thanks for the blessings which you have bestowed upon Terry in this life. They are signs to us of your goodness and of our fellowship with the saints in Christ. Merciful Lord, turn toward us and listen to our prayer. Open the gates of paradise to tarry, and help us to remain to comfort one another with assurances of faith, until we all meet in Christ and are with you and with tarry forever. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now we take our sister. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand. Precious Lord, lead me home. When my way grows drear, precious Lord, linger near. When my life is almost gone, hear my cry. my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. When the darkness appears and the light draws near and the day is past and gone, at the river I stand my feet, hold my hand, take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. That concludes the services for Terry at this time. Uh, but before we close completely, I would like to give everybody the opportunity to come and pay your final respects again. So starting in the rear of the chapel and working your way forward, you can come by and pay your final respects. And then we'll leave the last few minutes in private for the immediate family. But before we do that, I just want to say what a beautiful service it was. And you all just shared from your heart and your mom's love and legacy is going to continue in your family. And in answer to your question, Pat, don't leave me. The answer is right here in what you guys chose for the back of her cards. When tomorrow starts without me, please try to understand that an angel came and called my name and took me by the hand. The angel said my place was ready in heaven far above and that I would have to leave behind all those I dearly love. But when I walked through heaven's gates, I felt so much at home, for God looked down and smiled at me and told me, welcome home. So when tomorrow starts without me, do not think we're far apart. For every time you think of me, remember, I'm right here in your heart. So the same way she cared for all those homesick campers, she's going to continue to do that for each of you. So if you'd like to come up from the rear of the chapel, 
up your left side of the chapel and you can come by and pay your final respects and then exit the chapel. Thank you.